Hello everyone, my name is Pepsilk and after putting an unhealthy amount of time into this game over the past few weeks, I think I'm ready to finally give my thoughts on Last Epoch, the Diablo 4 killer as everyone seems to be calling it on the internet. In a time where RPGs are beginning to shine again with many new titles and IPs releasing, Last Epoch happens to be the latest in a surprising start to 2024, being the third game to break out and peak a player count higher than Path of Exile, one of its competitors I'd argue and coming after Power World and Helldivers 2, which both broke out in their own rights. The main reason for Epoch breaking out is that it's a new ARPG, and ARPGs generally don't get made as much as they used to, with fans of Diablo 4 feeling disappointed months after its launch with horrible seasons, a boring endgame, and not a lot of fun to be had. So as a result of this, many players flocked over to Epoch after the game being fully released, and even the subreddit blew up, with many posts asking whether or not Last Epoch is better or more fun than Diablo 4. I remember during Point 0.9 Last Epoch that the play count soared and lots of people were asking questions on it, showing just how bad Diablo 4 was and, well, still is. I'm going to be answering the question of whether or not you should be playing Last Epoch as of the full release. What makes the game enjoyable? Does it do anything from its competitors? Is the end game fun? Do the characters and classes feel unique and fun to use? I'll try my best to answer all these and give you my honest opinion on whether or not you should play this game. If you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe and notifications turned on for more gaming content. Let's get into it, shall we? Last Epoch is an ARPG or action RPG set in a time traveling universe and pins the player into a world where you fight humans and monsters, get loot and become stronger. That's pretty much Epoch and any ARPG in a nutshell really. The game spawns over a 9 act campaign that has you travel through different dimensions and time periods in order to restore time to the universe, while also changing the scenery and visit all kinds of locales. Comparing it to D4, the games are similar in that you kill things, get stuff, and become progressively stronger over time until you eventually become powerful enough that you'll feel like a monster, face melting every enemy that's in your path. Last Epoch has 5 characters to choose from and 15 mastery classes, each character having 3 which gives you a special set of abilities and a playstyle that suits that mastery. The masteries are cool in that each provide a different way of playing and is arguably one of the standouts of the game, similar to Path of Exile with Ascendancies. Except you get them earlier. My current character at the moment is the Rogue and I opted to pick the Falconer, one of the game's new masteries, where you're given a bird that can attack, can't take damage and has abilities of its own that gives my Falcon offensive capabilities. It also has explosive traps, similar to Diablo 2's Assassin class, and a net which sort of reminds me of Vayne from League of Legends in that you bounce yourself back and shoot a net at an enemy that then immobilizes them when it hits. I've played the Primalist Druid and the Paladin Sentinel as well, and they're both amazing fun too, although since 1.0 changed a lot of things and brought my characters prior to the Legacy Cycle, I won't be covering those characters for this video. Speaking of cycles, I should probably quickly mention what they are before moving on. Cycles are essentially leagues of Path of Exile or Seasons of Diablo 4, offering up new content and season exclusive activities to do over 3 to 4 months, but at the moment, isn't too much of a big deal for Epoch aside from the factions, which I'll cover later. You could choose between Cycle and Legacy if you have old characters, but if it's your first time playing, this won't be much of a concern. For those who've played prior to 1.0, I recommend playing Cycle anyway, just because a lot of other people are and will be the best way to make the 1.0 experience more fun. When the Cycle ends, your gear gets moved to Legacy alongside the stash and all of your gear, so you won't lose your character in the process. The whole point of Cycles is to provide replayability and player retention, keeping the game fresh with new balance changes, events, and possibly new classes and skills, should the developers be up for releasing that sort of stuff. More so for releasing classes and skills alongside a cycle of course, everything else just makes sense. They do have plans to expand the game with new classes and content over the next few years, so I'm excited to see what will be coming up next. For anyone looking for a great story with plot twists and plenty of interesting moments, you will not feel right at home with Last Epoch. It's forgetful, boring, and not too exciting given how hard it can be to really tell time travel lore. Outside of one particular moment I remember of being on top of a flying bird, although this is short lived, there just isn't anything to write home about this one and you can tell it was something 11th hour games developed and thought about at the last minute, making sure that everything else works first before anything else since the team is a group of talented veteran ARPG players. You know very well that for these kinds of games, it's always the gameplay and end game that take priority first before anything else. If you want a game of this similar nature with something good, the Diablo games are probably the best example of this, or even Grimdawn since it offers player choice with the story, 
and the faction system helps to pick sides and quote unquote get the best gear that you can get for your character should you level them high enough. The campaign just feels like an awfully long tutorial that helps to set up for the end game. I honestly think that Last Epoch doesn't do anything interesting in terms of gameplay and the gameplay loop. In fact, it's so similar to Diablo 4 that you'll feel right at home playing this one. The only difference I guess would be the sound design which Blizzard are well known for but outside of that it's just good. Not bad, not great, not horrible. Fun enough that everything feels flashy, cool and satisfying to use, both weapons and magic. However, one thing that Epoch does incredibly well is its progression and that's through its skills and passive system. So going into the game now, oh my god there's a lot of people here. Uh, Epoch has both a skills and passive system, and I think the skills is one of the coolest things that this game does. So, when you first start, you have these skills to unlock first. So you'll be going, you'll be getting these skills one at a time, and once you hit about around level 15 to 20, and you get to this area here called the End of Time, you'll talk to a guy up top, and you'll get access to your first mastery class. So each of these mastery classes, well, we have three to choose from, which are Blade Dancer, Marksman, and Falconer for the Rogue, and you have three for the other characters. And each of them provide their own um, unique skills, which you can still use these other skills by leveling them by leveling them up in the passive trees or their respectable passive trees. But you get a special passive bonus. So quickly, just before we get into it, I'll talk about the skills first, but we'll cover it. So here, when you pick the mastery skill or you, you pick your mastery, which in this case I picked Falconer, you gain plus 12 dexterity and plus one Falcon melee damage per four dexterity. And you also get the mastery skill, which is my Falcon. Basically, in a nutshell, for this one, the mastery skill is simply just a falcon. You get the falcon that fights with you, flies around with you. It also has an ability called Falcon Strikes, which attacks enemies in like all kinds of directions around an area, based on where where you um, where you mark it. And yeah, it's a really cool skill. Moving on to the passive skills. So each passive skill has its own skill tree. So if I go between my different skills here, you can see that every skill has its own skill tree. And I think it's one of the coolest things that Epoch does because you can essentially play around with this and create all kinds of builds. Like, you know, even like some of the other skills like multi-shot, um, net, and they have all kinds of different, I guess, quote unquote skills or abilities or passives, if you want to call it that, like that. And they can give all kinds of bonuses. So the build that I'm currently doing is a Dive Bomb Falconer build. So Dive Bomb, this is essentially my main skill. And I've built Dive Bomb for maximum damage. So I started off with going for Rushing Wings, into which gives uh, damage and reduced delay. Because it takes a while for it to drop at first. But if you max this out, it drops almost instantly. And you want to be able to do that in order to maximize the value of your skills. Or, or of the skill, sorry. Then you got Devastating Dive. That gives you even more damage but also costs a lot more. And to help offset that, I have Rush of the Hunt, which gives you increased cooldown recovery speed, and United Assault, where you reduce a portion of Dive Bomb's remaining cooldown when you use a throwing or bow attack. And this complements all of my Explosive Trap. So for my Explosive Trap, I've built it to be like uh, Explosive Arrow, for those who, who may know that from Path of Exile or Toxic Rain, to where when you shoot um, when you shoot the traps, they instead rain down as opposed to just throwing them in front of you. And it also converts the stats that you see here into bow damage and bow attack speed. So now I can find affixes or items that can, any items that boost bow damage and attack speed, I can, I get bonuses with the skill. And it makes it, it makes it really powerful, especially when you get a lot of attack speed, because when you work that with this skill right here, you can basically get your dive bomb back, or I can get my dive bomb back all the time or almost all the time so i can always have it up and since this is my main source of damage i want to be able to use explosive trap to get my dive bomb as many times as possible and then i've got the falconry or the the falconer mastery skill which i've just sort of built for um this falconer's mark which makes you deal damage to more targets and also have the falcon scale um with your with both your bow damage and your critical damage to help boost the critical chance and the critical damage even further so the Falcon being able to get all those bonuses means that I could I could stack up both critical strike chance, um, critical strike multiplier, and and basically stack it up to help make it even stronger. And the highest damage I believe I've done with uh, with one dive bomb is like six hundred, if not seven hundred thousand for a critical. It, it's it's 
it's ridiculous and it, it just shreds bosses if you can get, if you can proc the crit on it of course but whole idea is that you can create it's you don't have to just do a dive bomb build you can also switch up dive bomb to make it more situational or you can build falcon strikes to be more powerful uh a good example would be that here these three skills here revolve around acid flask which is this skill right here and you can combine these two skills to help coincide not only coincide with each other but also give different bonuses and, you, and and it basically just makes you have more acid flasks so if you wanted to make like an acid flask build where acid flask is all about dealing fizz damage and reducing armor of enemies you can do that with the falconer you can do it with these three skills falcon throws acid flask for you flask satchel you get more charges and when you directly use Acid Flask, your Falcon has a chance to gain additional Acid Flask charges. So basically have even more Acid Flask charges than what, you, than what you, you're you going to get um, with however you build your Acid Flask. And they all work so well with each other. Um, the last two skills I'm using are Aerial Assault, where I've just kind of built Aerial Assault to be my main movement skill. I was originally using Shift, which is like a quick dash, like a like a typical, like like the dodge button you see in like Diablo 4. But the problem is dodge wasn't really working too well for me. So I switched that out to aerial assault. I'll show you exactly. You're probably wondering how the hell did you switch that? I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. So if I wanted to, if I wanted to remove a skill here, because you, you, you only start off with, um, with one special skill, I think at like level five, I believe. And at every uh, so few or so levels, you will gain each of these um, specializations. You can only spec up to five skills. So if you if you find if you find that's one of one part of your build isn't working the way that it should, what you can do is you can either one, if you spec into the wrong skills, you can respec. I won't do it here because I'll have to go through the effort to level up the skills again. Even though it doesn't take that long, it would it would just be kind of a hassle and I don't want to do that. So you've got two options here. You can one remove skill points where you can simply remove a skill um from whatever skill that you spec into that you didn't like. So say I wanted to respec uh, Falcon Falcon's Havoc. If I was to click remove points and click on this, it will remove the point. You can you get another prompt to say yes, and it removes the point entirely. So what it does is it removes it reduces the spec level by one, and you'll have to level up the skill again. But if you head into the monolith or the end game later on, and you're like around level 70, 75, or oh actually more so 80. Um, you'll be able to level it up incredibly fast. It won't take that long. If you were to say spec it all the way down to level 10 and do a few of the like early end game monoliths, you'll be able to level it up incredibly fast. It won't take that long. And then you have the other option, which is to despecialize skills. So despecializing will remove all skill points and experience from the skill and allow you to specialize in another skill of its, in its place. The new skill will start at your minimum skill level. So my minimum specialized level, as you can see there, is level 10. So if I was to despec Aerial Assault and put Shift in, Shift will start at level 10, and then I just have to level it back up, which it levels up at a faster pace um, when, you're, when you're at the maximum like level. So you can level it up really fast combined with that accelerated rate. And it just helps to kind of quickly respec without having to you know go through the effort to, I guess, do other like things, if you will. But it's, it's a very easy to use respec system that doesn't involve... That doesn't involve anything other than your time because you got to use that time to level up a, either a new skill or level up the current one that you're using. And then we have the passive skills, which are essentially just like the passive skill tree, like any other ARPG. But you get all the skill trees as soon as you get your mastery. At first, you only have the rogue skill tree and you'll have to spend at least 20 skill points before you can start specking into your mastery skill. The game is, I don't think the game tells you that. It may be in the, in the game's um, game guide, which if you press G, it pulls up a really cool game guide. Very handy, by the way, for those that want to learn about anything and everything. So if I type up resistance, resistances, here you go. If I type up end game, monolith introduction, arenas, you can learn more all about it here. This game guide is so freaking cool. I don't think any other ARPG has a cool game guide like this. And if so, you have to go on a website to do it. Why go on a website when you have it in game? It's beautiful. I recommend everyone should check it out. If you're, if you're stuck on something, before you ask the chat, look in the game guide. I guarantee you, majority of your answers will be in this game guide. So back to the passives. You spec, in, you spec 20 points into the rogue skill tree. Um, you spec in, or whatever class, uh, default class you're playing. 
you get your mastery and then you start specking to your mastery skill tree. It's fairly straightforward. It's lined up in rows and columns or more so rows. So you spend an X amount of skill points. See the lines here, one, two, three, four, five. You get your first skill point, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then, and then it just keeps going. You have a long um, break between that until your, into your third skill, fourth skill. Pretty much the same setup across all the skill trees. It's, it's, um, you get the skills at the same levels. And the whole idea is just to push through the tree, but also just like, it just gives a lot of customization into how, or as to how you want to quote unquote, you know, build your character. For me, I'm with my Falcon tree, I'm building haste area. Crit, crit chance because I want that crit chance to apply to my minions. Like, of course, I got to get that. Um, and I got crit avoidance and just, and yeah, more so just haste. Haste is like the main thing here, combined with uh, dexterity to help increase my armor and give a, um, and give a bit of extra survivability because I'm also building evasion and I need all the decks I can get or else I'm going to get clapped. Uh, and that also couples really well with my smoke bomb too, which also helps me give haste. Um, and also, once you get your mastery skills, you can also spec into the other two skill trees. You just won't have the mastery skill. That's the difference. So if you feel like you need a situational skill or a skill that can help you give a little boost, like for, in the Blade Dancer tree, even that's very melee focused. But I got Cloak of Shadows for the extra dexterity and the Glancing Blow chance, which when you get hit by a, and a Glancing Blow procs, it deals 35% less damage. I should take my time here. I'm, I'm talking too fast. Can't relax. Can't relax. Okay. And draining arrows, which increases my bow attack speed and also gives me extra HP, which is always nice to have more life. More life in ARPGs is life is your best friend. The more you have, the better chance you have of surviving. So very, very handy to have those. But nothing to really write home out about here other than just being a way to another way to help progress your character. And that leads me to my next point, which is itemization. I think the itemization in Epoch is fantastic and it works really well with the crafting system, which I'll get into later, but all the affixes in this game have, have a sense of meaning and percentage factor in that it doesn't feel like it's necessarily RNG or, you know, even just getting the lowest percentile of that TR that you get, whatever prefix or suffix it may be, is well worth it. So items in this game in terms of affixes, are divided into tiers. So a perfect example would be this. So for this item, I have two prefixes and two suffixes. Both my suffixes are tier three and four, which depending on the higher the tier, the higher percentage it goes up to. And then I have a plus six, and then I have a tier six, which is the exalted item, which these, you can only get tier six, and you can also get tier sevens, but they're only, they're only dropped from uh, these purple items or exalted items. And these tiers kind of help to make your character stronger. You can, you can, they, they spawn randomly from items and enemies that you kill. And it just, it's very simple to follow in that it just makes your character stronger. The higher the tier, the more powerful it is. Um, and all the affixes like, you know, for example, this one is very essential. Throw a plus three to dive bomb and 110% increased minion damage. The maximum roll that you can get on this is 120. 110 is huge. It is insanely huge. I think just, if, if I was to get like 100% minion damage, that's more than worth it. Because every every percent that you get in this game, even if it's just 1% higher, is huge. It makes such a big difference to make your character a lot stronger. Something that I feel like Diablo 4, uh, when it first came out, I'm not going to talk about the current season because I haven't played the new season. But just playing from my season 1 experience or my season 0 experience, if you will. That experience of the itemization was really bad in that most of the affixes felt meaningless, like increased chance to find potions, which I feel like if your character is so strong, you don't really need that, especially for end game, unless you're running like a, like a pop build with, um, I believe it's the item, the unique item is called tenacity. Don't quote me on that. Could be wrong. But I remember there was an item that made it so that using a potion would give you over health and that would make you, I guess, more of a tank and have temporary health. And I mean, I guess that's one way I can think of using those. But there was a lot of like meaningless affixes that I felt like the percentages didn't make too much of a difference. Or even then it was like 18.7, 9.6, 20.5. Like why do we need specific decimal place percentages or percentiles? Just give us, just round it up like Epoch does it. Round it up to 24 plus 7, 5%. We don't need 
any of these percentiles where I'm rounding up to one decimal place. Like, it just felt really stupid. I don't know if they've changed that now. Please let me know in the comments if they have. But if they haven't, I, I just find it mind-boggling to me. But at least everything in Epoch feels worth, worth the take. It feels impactful. It feels important. But I think the itemization in this game is really good. And the unique items in this game are also so cool. I've, I've just been stashing a ton of them in here and just, just saving them. Because I feel like it may come in handy if I decide to level up another character. Which I probably will. But they just look really cool. They, they, each of them look really cool. And also have their own, like, um, you know, things and niches built into it. You know? And I haven't even gone into the crafting yet. Which I'm about to cover right now. So, the crafting. Let me just quickly go in here. I want to buy some starting items so I can kind of showcase it a bit. Uh, let's see. I'll just get a few items quickly. That'll do. So, the crafting system in Epoch is one of the best things that a lot of people talk about. Crafting is one of the best things that Epoch does, and I think it's amazing how good the crafting system is in this game. Because not only can you make lower level items more powerful, but you can also turn blues into really strong weapons if you get lucky. So, crafting in a nutshell works like this. You put a weapon in here, you have prefixes and suffixes, you have forging potential. Forging potential is randomized, so items can range from about. I mean, magic items will have will generally have less rage, uh, ray, uh, sorry, forging potential, and rare items will have more forging potential. With exalted having the highest. Unique weapons, unfortunately, you can't craft, but you can get special items called uh, that have weaver's will. So, cradle of the erased, for example, all these erased items, I believe, have weaver's will um, embedded into them. Weaver's Will makes it so that you can put affixes on it. So if I was to say, take this out, swap this out, put this in, you can put affixes into, into this unique item. But if I was to try and put it into, say, Yulia's Path, which are these boots, um, you can't put them in, you can't forge your knees because it doesn't have any form of potential on them. So each of them have different tiers. And the, the whole point of these tiers is that you can upgrade these tiers and make them more stronger. So... Reduced bonus damage taken from critical strikes. If I was to apply this, and I'll get rid of the glyph for now, and I'll get rid of those for now, because I'll talk about those in a moment. It'll cost between 1 to 18 forging potential, and this will vary depending on the tier. So if I click it, it actually ended up burning through the entire item. So that forging potential is gone. You can actually influence that not costing anything by using these glyphs. Um, the main one being glyph of hope. So... You'll get to a point where you're going to have so many of them that you'll basically be using them for everything that you craft. This makes it so that an item that you craft has a 25% chance to cost nothing. So if you manage to, it'll say that it'll preserve forging potential. Uh, let's see if I can get lucky with an item here. So if I try this item, uh, I'll add something to it. Let's see what's something that I have that's really high. I'll add physical damage. We add this one. Unfortunately, did not do anything. We'll try it again. Glyph of Hope preserved forging potential, so it'll help preserve that, and you can help, and and it'll also in, uh, make it so that you'll have more, you know, you'll save your potential, and you'll be able to craft even more on it, right? The other glyphs include Glyph of Chaos, which makes it so it swaps out the randomly upgraded affix to a new one, so you'll still be upgrading, it, but it'll change to a different affix um, of that similar, of that similar um, fix, whatever it may be. So. It'll, it'll cycle between prefixes for fizz, and if I make a suffix here, say, um, increase stun chance, it'll roll, it'll upgrade, and it'll roll any suffix that's within that's within here, basically. Uh, order makes it so it, modif it prevents the roll of an affix uh, changing. So, say here, if I have 110% minion damage, and I upgrade that to T... If I was able to upgrade that, say, to T7, or if it was T4, and I upgraded to T5... It will, it, will, it, will, it will keep the same values on there. It won't change those values. Because the values always change when you upgrade the tiers. Then you've got Glyph of Despair. That's a whole other thing. Experimental affixes has a chance to seal an affix. So you can essentially save yourself a slot. And then you've got the runes. The runes are also really interesting too. So you've got Shattering. This is going to be essential. This right here, this rune is your best friend. This helps, to, this helps you prioritize affixes. So if I was to bring the sword back... This one here, I think I can, yeah. And you click shatter, it'll shatter a, a random amount of these affixes based on what tier it is. So this would be two, this could be five, four, and one. Shatter this one, boom. 
for one plus one fire damage, plus one stun, and plus one bonus damage. Not the best shatter, but shatter, it's better than no shatter. It's also random too, so you may get plus four of one affix and you won't get any of the others. It's very dependent on RNG. You've also got refinement, which rerolls the values of affixes. That also costs potential. Removal, which removes a random affix. Uh, discovery, which helps add random tier one affixes. This is this is this is more of a uh, leveling, um, a leveling rune. I feel like when you're making a new character, it just helps to kind of give you basic affixes to help uh, pile through the campaign a lot faster. Uh, implicit, so I think implicits are the percentages. So yes, it rerolls percentages. And then you've got Rune of Ascendance. This this changes an item into a unique item. I'll demonstrate it quick because I've got I've got plenty, so it's okay. So we use this one. We can also make we can also use a Cliff of Hope in it to cost nothing. I don't think it matters either way because it shouldn't because they don't have forging potential in them. Ascend, boom. Oh, I actually don't have this, so this is a new weapon for me. It's very handy for trying to target farm items. So if you're trying to chase a pair of boots, you buy a bunch of boots. Put them in, use that Ascendance item, and just hope hope to God that you get the boots that you want. You can just keep doing it until you get what you want. Those Ascendance um, runes are also really rare, so it's good, best to keep that in mind and use them sparingly. And then you've got the Rune of Research. I don't know what these other ones with the zero that I have zero of. Uh, I'm not too sure what those are. A Rune of Research is also similar to where it's seals and experimental outfix, but that's a whole other topic. The, the, the point of the crafting system is that it helps to bring low levels up to speed, you can, you can min-max and increase the, the really good items that you have, like I've been doing with all of my items here, really. It helps to make your items a hell of a lot stronger, more powerful, and just helps you power through the content. Like, I have a friend that's been playing Epoch that, that says that he doesn't use the crafting system out of spite. I don't know if he's doing... I feel like he's bullshitting. I've told him numerous times that crafting is a best friend. You should be crafting. He's like, no, no, I use it out of spite. And when you don't use crafting, you get clapped. Even if it may seem like, from what I last told him, he wasn't getting clapped as often. Crafting is your best friend, and everybody, once, once, it's not too difficult to learn. Once you figure out the fortune potential and all the different affixes and suffixes and prefixes and runes and glyphs, you'll be able to get it down, down packed. And it's, it's very, very helpful for establishing your builds and making what you want to make. And now we're going to talk about arguably the most important thing with any ARPG for the average player, even the casuals. And that's the end game. So when you finish the campaign, you'll and you go to the end of time, you'll be introduced to the Monolith of Fate. And these are different areas that you can go to. There's about 10 of them. And it says to do 20 of them because you have to complete... I don't know why, that, that has to be a bug. You have to complete each of these timelines in order to get like buffs and blessings, which I'll also get to in a moment. Basically, you start from Fall of the Outcast. So this is the first one you go to. There's a, for me, this is there's currently a choice to pick. This will be at a significantly lower level. So for Fall of the Outcast, it's 58, 62, 66, and it'll continuously go up until uh, the highest, which is level 90. So you pick, you pick, or technically for normals, this will, this will, there will be no picking. You'll just automatically get introduced to it. And this is the map in a nutshell. So you start off, you start off from the from the beacon itself, or like from the main area, which is usually the middle. And then you complete different echoes, as they call them. So you go through different areas, completing different areas of uh, different maps and collecting rewards. And each of these echoes also have modifiers and player modifiers and also an echo rewards that coincide with them so for this one here we've got a unique green that we seem to be able to get 29 timeline stability and up to 60 bonus timeline stability and this stability works towards charging this up which for normals at first you will unlock you will unlock each of each of these quests every for every milestone of or that you get to so the first one here for here is 150 and 550. I'm not sure if normal actually has the numbers. Oh, it does have the numbers. Nice. Okay. So you do these quests and here they're optional because you don't, you're not inclined to do them if you don't want to. But in the normal one of this, you'll have to do them. So you'll do that. You'll go to those quests. You'll complete those quests that work towards um, unlocking the quest echo, which you just simply earn by continuously doing... Um, different echoes and the further you go the higher stability or 
the more stability that you can gain from them. So this one here was 28 and this one in the back here is 32. So you want to try and sort of spread the monolith out a bit. That's my best advice. I know for a new player, this is going to be incredibly complicated, uh, but bear with me here. So each of these provide, we'll go back to the set item. So 30% health, 8% increased item rarity and 12% experience gain, which experience gain is a pretty big deal because once you hit level, I think 75 or 80, the game becomes an absolute slog to level, just like Diablo 4 did. It takes so long to level up in this game. But thankfully, there is a way you can get experience um, in these monoliths by getting Echoes that have a Tomes of Experience reward, which I unfortunately don't have one right now here. But there is one where you get these books and they just give you experience then. When, they, when you get a bunch of them, they all stack up together, you get lots of experience. It all contributes towards leveling up, which you still get skill points after leveling up to 80 or like 75, by the way, for those that may be used to PoE, because I believe in PoE, you don't get any skill points after 70. I could be tripping. I could be tripping. It's been a while since I've played PoE. But yeah, it just takes a while to level up, but you don't get any experience points, I don't think. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And yeah, you work towards that, you get the quest echo, you defeat the boss, and you... And you rinse, repeat the monoliths. You do that 10 times for the normals until you get the empowered monoliths. And then the empowered monoliths is where it steps up. Everything goes up to level 100. You have a corruption um, system now where the higher you go, the more, the better the loot, the higher, the higher the health and the more damage your enemies deal. Basically just a, a scaling difficulty that you can pretty much influence with these gaze of aura business that you get where you defeat the boss uh, for the quest echo. And then you get these like special... Um, Echoes called Shades of Oribus, so you defeat them, corruption goes up, etc, etc. And also, the modifiers can carry over between Echoes. So, just be mindful of when you're doing one, say this one here, enemies have 25% to all resistances. If you grab this one, they will they will occur for three the next three Echoes that you do. So, you want to keep in mind of the modifiers that you don't want to deal with in terms of your build and, and maybe your current position in like how your, you know, maybe your life is doing, how your damage is doing. Maybe, you know, for resistances, if you're doing an elemental build, you don't want to be getting these. You want to try and stay away from these as much as you can because elemental damage is your main source of damage, right? Just as an example. And that's the end game in a nutshell. That's as simple as it gets. There are more complicated things like beacons and these special echoes that spawn every now and then. But for the most part, you get random rewards, you pick whatever you want to do and you go for it. It's really nice that you can target farm items in these monoliths because when you get the empowered ones, they kind of tell you that um, you can get specific um, gear from those monoliths. So if you're target farming, say, rings, which is what I'm doing right now for the Age of Winter, you can you can go go to the Age of Winter and then just and then just keep doing this one and to go for those ring to go for those unique and set um, rewards. And it's really nice to be able to choose what you want. You're not inclined to force yourself to pick a map. And the corruption, that's also optional too. You don't have to corrupt yourself and make it more difficult if you want to. It's just nice to do it for the challenge. I'm really doing it most, more so for the experience because I'm trying to get to level 100 as soon as possible, I guess. I'm level 98 right now and it is a struggle. It's a struggle, man, to level up from like 90 onwards to 100. It takes ages to level up. It feels like a chore at times. And I gauge that a lot of people, by the time they hit like around level 90, or maybe even 80, or 85, they'll probably get bored and want to make a new character or move on to another game. So, my first piece of advice, and probably the only piece of advice I'd give, because this is more of a should you play video, I don't want to change to change the subject too much, would be to reduce the amount of experience ga um, that you need to level up from 90 plus, please. Make the, make the level 100 grind a lot quicker, for the love of God. The problems I have with monoliths is that monoliths can feel very repetitive after a while since there really isn't anything extra to do outside of the enemy modifiers. And I think that the, the monoliths need more variety and more like event scenarios like we see in Path of Exile. The reason why Path of Exile is so successful as an endgame ARPG is because they always manage to incorporate old league mechanics from previous leagues into the new league. So... There's always different things that you can do every time. And that's, that's, that's what makes Path of Exile get away with doing the same maps and locations over and over again. Is that there's always something new to do or something cool that you run into. So you're always going to be completing different events and different, like, in, in, in different, 
you know, batches of fashion and cycles and all that kind of stuff. I just think that if Epoch could benefit, Epoch could benefit from doing the exact same thing. Like even if they copy them, I think that's the way to go. Just add more pinnacle content, add more, um, you know, bosses, add some new activities or exclusive activities that we can do in the monolith to help shake things up. Like even Diablo 4, as simple as it is, they have like, you know, you know, those, those shrines where you interact with the shrines, you kill a bunch of enemies and then you get the shrine, right? Like just something as simple as that could help make the game feel a lot more enjoyable than just simply going through a map and completing whatever objectives there may be. I forgot to mention the objectives before, but the objectives, you get, you get a different objective for every monolith you go to, like slaying a bunch of enemies to find a gate, slaying a bunch of enemies to find monsters, location gets put on the map, you head straight to the, the boss or the mini boss, whatever it may be, you kill it and then finishes or you you're you're either destroying or you're killing and as simple as that is it's not enough to keep uh the monoliths interesting they need to add more than just different objectives last epoch also has a new feature that i'd argue is um that's really been illustrated from a lot of players and that's the faction system factions are really cool in this game in that you get two to pick from which is the circle of fortune which uh, which i'm currently in and the merchant skill which is a trading guild I don't know much about the Merchant's Guild, but I'd like to know more about it in the comments if anyone is in the Merchant's Guild and can just talk about their experiences. I've seen a few experiences on Reddit and some videos, but I've heard that the Merchant's Guild is kind of weird, in a weird spot right now. Like, it feels like it's good, but it's also bad, and people in the currency hasn't been fully established yet, and people are selling things for, you know, cheap or, um, or high prices expensive prices and it's a bit of a mess but i'd like to know everyone else's personal experiences on that guild if you joined it first but i joined the circle of fortune since i think this is the way to go for a lot of players i think for any first time players you should join this uh faction instead of the merchant's guild and, and wait a bit later to join the merchant's guild just because you know the game is relatively new this is all about this is all about loot getting lots and getting lots of it and it's worth it. It's just better this early on to join this than to join the Merchant's Guild and try to start selling shit. I just don't think that's the play. So Circle of Fortune is a really, really cool faction in that it's all about loot. You you gain different... You, there's 10 levels and you earn levels by completing quests. So quest echoes or killing enemies. You kill enemies, you get favor and reputation, which the reputation all goes towards leveling the faction up and every level has its own rewards you've got adam drop chance rune of ascendance idols t7s and rotor exalted it's just a, just a, just to name a few of them i'm guessing you could probably read the rest of them while i'm scrolling through here and another unique thing about this is that they also have a its own like prophecy system which is really interesting so basically you can kind of target farm similar to how you target farm in monoliths for items but you can specifically target target farm um gear that you want so if you go over to one of these prophecies we'll go to the weapons one as an example you can see that from here you you can use you you spend your favor to to buy to buy these and you can re-roll them until you get what you want so for example if i want bows i want to try and get unique bows because there's a bow that i'm looking for which is the one that i currently have which is the talons of of valor but I'm trying to get a god build of this one, uh, a god roll to get plus four to all my skills. So I'd want to keep re-rolling until I get a uh, legendary bow. I'll try to do it a few times. If I don't get it, I won't bother going uh, on too much about it. But basically you can re-roll, you can, you can target farm items and there's a bunch of different, there's a bunch of, uh, sorry, not bunch. There's an objective um, assigned to it. So for example, the death of Majaza. So that's, she's the final boss of Act 9. You go to the Chamber of Vessels. If you kill that boss, she'll give you two unique, four unique two-handed swords. Um, the Quiver, Death of Herod. So he's the boss in the Age of Winter timeline. If you kill him with that condition to have 160 corruptions, that's in an empowered monolith, you'll get unique quivers. And you can and you can make this even better by applying these lenses. So I have two lenses here for each of the um each of the telescopes so one is to remove arenas and the others to remove dungeons so that way i don't have to because i prefer to i prefer to play monoliths over arenas and dungeons oh and speaking of those two i didn't I, i'm not going to be covering those for this video just because 
I'm yet to play the arenas or the dungeons. I've just been mainly sticking to monoliths. So if anyone's curious on that, I'm very sorry. I'm not going to be able to tell you too much about it. But for the lenses, you go into here and you buy... Um, you can buy these with favor too. They're relatively cheap as well. You just you just simply apply them to um, a telescope and then boom, you have you can get rid of arenas and you can get rid of dungeon events just like that. There's also regional lenses which are like very target specific. So if you want bows, you can grab the bow lens. If you want daggers, you can grab the dagger lens. Um, armor, you can buy, buy the armor lens. These are more or less, I feel like for... Um, for level 9, I feel like at the moment I've just not too... haven't been too bothered about them. And since re-rolling is very cheap, it's probably better to just keep re-rolling and just do it that way. But I feel like when I hit level 9, I'm definitely going to target farm and try to add those regional lenses in there to make them more fun. Last thing I want to cover before we close it all off is the offline mode. I wanted to give it a special mention and a shout out to 11th Hour Games for developing a fully offline mode for Last Epoch. I think... An offline mode for this sort of game is insane. So if you go into your Steam and change it to change the launch settings to full offline mode and launch your game, you can play the game entirely offline. You do not need to be there's no um, there's no connection to uh, to a back end that you need to go through. You can just get into the game and play it offline without needing to have an online connection. This is a big W because in a world where every game needs some form of fucking online connection to play. Um, Epoch has done the impossible, essentially, by giving players a fully offline mode. For those that don't want to deal with, you know, people or have limited connections or download speeds and all that stuff, just know that the only thing with this is that if you do it, you can't transfer your character over to online. So it is something to consider when you pick offline mode. But hey, if you want to play the game and you can't play online, can't play your character, better to play offline mode, right? And it's funny too, because it reminds me of another game that should have done the same thing or should have had the same thing to a launch but yeah look what happened to that i just figured i'd mention it since it's really cool to see a feature like this get added and you'll still be able to play the latest content when it drops on it too which is freaking sick last epoch is an amazing arpg that bridges the gap between diablo 4 and path of exile not being too easy like diablo 4 and not being as complicated as path of exile you can make the game as hard or as easy as you want since there's plenty of builds and options that you can pick from and Almost anything and everything you can think of is viable. It's just a matter of how far or how much you want to push it until it, well, doesn't work anymore. The gameplay is fun and while the endgame may feel a bit repetitive and lacking at the moment, the next big patch, 1.1, is said to address that by introducing new changes and adding pinnacle encounters for us to fight. So that's something I'm looking forward to. The game has such great potential and will most likely be my go-to ARPG. At least until Path of Exile 2 comes out anyway. If you made it to the end of the video, thanks for watching. If I miss anything, comment down below. I'll have more coming to you soon. Peace.